numbers tests as well as positivity rate as well as what's happening with the cases as well as what's happening in the healthcare system i do want to get to the schools but dr niego want to ask you real quickly can you give us any more specifics in terms of what we're looking for uh, that would that would make the harris county public health uh, look at this and say you know what uh, we retract that order or we uh, agree uh, that that kids are ready to go back on campus well thank you jana and again thank you dr shaw um for for um, giving that information as well and thank you again for the opportunity to to be a part of this discussion um it's also nice to to see some of the superintendents as well um so i would just echo a lot of what has already been said we in this task force have have been tasked with really looking at not only what our partners are doing across the state but we're also looking at what our partners are doing across the country um as well as looking at what other countries have done out around the globe. And so we've been able to look at what some of those metrics are and really trying to 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 hone in on what some of those best metrics are for us. Um not only as an individual health department but really looking at that um at those some, those criteria very carefully from a regional standpoint because we do know that these school districts are not just uniquely um placed within um very clear borders and jurisdictions. We have multiple school districts that uh that cover of several different counties and so we want to make sure that we're engaging with our um regional partners as well but we're certainly looking at a much lower positivity rate um we're also looking much at lower, that much lower what's much lower i mean certainly certainly around i mean right now as dr shaw pointed out we're around 20% and so i can tell you that in most um in most other states they're looking at somewhere around 10% as low as and in some places they're even looking as low as a goal of 2 to 3%. And so that's why I said we have to have those focused discussions from our regional partners before we sort of settle in on what a number is for us but right now at a at a rate of 10 to at a rate of 20% that certainly is much much higher than what we could even um recommend at this point. All right. Dr. Lathan, I want to go to you. But you've uh heard the data, <laughs> not just today, but I know you're in close uh, contact all the time with our health department. Based on the information you know about the current conditions, Dr. Lathan, and also the surveys that you've done. I know you've surveyed your students at HISD and you've also surveyed your teaching staff. How do you feel about your current decision and plan? Or do you feel like it might still need to be tweaked before we actually start to uh, put back up? with education. I still feel very good about our plan to start uh remote and to be remote for 6 weeks and then to transition students back on October 19th and it's based on those factors when we when I was making the decision that we would start online for the 6 weeks. I believe about 2 weeks ago the positivity rate was about 26%. So to hear that it's around 20 22, we'll take that that means that it's going down. but that was one of the major factors and then also looking at the number of decreasing cases over at least 14 to 20 consecutive days so i feel very good uh i know it's been a lot of changes that we've heard uh from the state level over the past uh, several days but i'm excited honestly that we don't have to go back and change our plan mhm you know if we're going to start and, and i'm going to talk to all the superintendents about this next question. If we're going to start online, so many students online. And again, I know you guys have done student surveys and I know that it seems like most folks don't want to go back to school whether teachers or students. Um so if we're going to do this this digital thing, how ready is HISD? I know last time we spoke you said you had a multi million dollar gap in terms of the uh access to Wi-Fi and computers that your students had currently and what they need to have. So where are you right now? We are right now based on the information in our student information system, we have about 23,000 uh devices that we need to deploy between now and uh September 8th and we are will be given that uh those devices out. We have uh actually some devices also for teachers that are in need. So yes, we're having to pay for it. Uh eventually there should be some matching dollars back from the state as it relates to uh operation connectivity. Uh the dilemma for HISD is we can't wait uh for that bulk order uh due to the de- delays that we're hearing for the number of months before those deliveries might be made. So we've placed our order, we're waiting and then we'll be placing another round 
for uh, lost devices, uh, misplaced devices, and um, you know, damaged devices. But we, gonna... our goal is to be there uh, by September 8th for every child that needs um, a hotspot and also a device. Okay. Do you, you think you're going to make it? We're going to get close. You know, I, I, I'll be like those Astros. We're going to slide into home plate. And, and, and so <laughs> we're going to get very close. If not, we have partners uh, that are partnering with us, and we will have options for students that do not have access. And that is for students that do not have a device and have access to the Internet. All right. Uh, Dr. Wilson from Spring uh, ISD. Dr. Watson, I'm sorry. Um, let me ask you, too, about that, the extent to which you feel your students are prepared for virtual learning. And on addition to that question, I want to add to you a question from Anita, who says, the option for virtual learning for children who have chronic underlying health issues, who have special needs, how do you handle that? Absolutely. So we've done a lot of work um, throughout the spring semester in, in really wanting to uh, make sure we placed a lot of orders for the technology that we know that our students need. We were able to deploy a variety of devices this past spring, but we wanted to ensure that all kids had access uh, to a device and connectivity. And so to your point, there's a lot of conversation that we're having regarding our students with special needs. Those students that regardless of, con of connectivity or regardless of the device that they have, that remote learning just isn't the best environment for them, for those individuals. And so we've really been working with parents and working with our staff to really identify. Um, we have about 35% of our families that want in-person instruction, and we do have teachers uh, that are dedicated and, and, and definitely concerned about their health, but we have some of those same teachers who want to come in and they want to be able to provide that service for our students with special needs because they know that without them, um, the type of education that they'll receive may be limited. And so we're working with them. Uh, first and foremost, we are going to ensure the safety for all of our students and all of our teachers, but we also know that we're educators and our job, much like the doctors, our job is to educate our community. And so in doing so, we've got to make sure that we can do so um, in an environment that, that definitely supports the safety of them, but that also meets the learning needs of the students. And so um, we do have teachers that are working with us that want to um, be able to do that when it's safe to be able to do that, but we've got to make sure that those students that need us the most um, have that learning available for them. What percentage of students then are you expecting on your campus, Dr. Watson? At this particular time, we're starting for the first four weeks of, of virtual instruction. And so we are going to start, as I said earlier, uh, four weeks virtual. And we do reserve the right to go to our board based upon uh, the data and the metrics uh, that we receive from Harris County uh, Public Health to make that decision to determine um, when we're going to go back. Um, we do know that um, there is a desire for families to go back. At the same time, there's a desire for some families uh, to stay at home. And so we've got to really meet the needs of both families and to ensure, first of all, that the learning takes place for all kids. And so when, uh, so when you go back, what is the percentage that you're expecting that will uh, want to be on campus? At this particular time, there's about 35% of our families that want to go back. And so in our model, uh, we have a plan to bring that 35% back um, when we're available to get them back when it's safe and to do so um, in using social distancing, using a hybrid model that still has 50% of that 35% back at any given day. Were you still looking at doing a day where you have cleaning in the middle of the week? Where yes. everyone goes so home and you clean during on Wednesdays or something? Absolutely. So on Wednesdays, that's the uh, remote day for all students. So all students will participate in uh, synchronous or asynchronous instruction on Wednesday, which really allows an opportunity for our, um, our custodial staff to really get in and do a deep cleaning of all of our facilities within spring. And makes it so important, though, that everyone have, have access to digital learning because everyone's going to be doing it. <laughs> to some extent, even if it's only Wednesday. Okay, I, I want to uh, get to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Gaffney and Aldine, and Aldine School District. Uh, I want to ask you the same question. To what extent do you think you're going to be ready on day one for digital learning? Do your students have access to Wi-Fi or, and or computers? And if not, do you think you're going to make it? Thank you so much, Gina, for the opportunity to share with our Aldine families. Um, I want to go back real quick to March 6th. Uh, mm -hmm. March 6th will forever be embedded in my memory because that's the last normal day of school as we know it. Uh, March 6th also sticks out in my mind because we were celebrating Teachers of the Year. And that day we had a, a scare. We had a, an alleged case and our team didn't know what we were going to do uh, to address that case. I mean, it was the first. And so that's when we knew something. We were going to have to do something different. And long story short, it turned out to be okay. We were able to look uh, 
partnered with the local authorities and the health officials, and it wasn't what we thought it was. But what we knew for sure was COVID-19 was not just about washing your hands, what we're going to do for our students when they return from spring break. And so, as you all know, because it's history now, we had to stand up at home learning site and uh, our teachers did an incredible job of that. And so, as we think about moving forward, you know, in uh, different times, for example, in, in May, when we set up our return to learn task force and the guiding principle was we were going to go as fast as we could, but as slow as we must. But the one thing to address your question that we learned um, or realized real quick <laughs> was the fact that our students, the digital divide was real and not all of our students had access. And so uh, we began to work quickly and with the support of uh, legislators, uh, TEA and others, uh, and different partnerships from Operation Connectivity, from utilizing resources that the board had set aside to prioritize, we recognized that we had to get devices, we had to get connectivity. And I was shocked, honestly, because I'm from the country, I'm from a rural area, and so I was accustomed to uh, not having connectivity in rural areas. But what shocked me is here in Houston, you know, not having connectivity is like not having indoor plumbing. And so it's a basic right that we've got to, I'm excited about the fact that we're going to be meeting that need for all of our students. And so as we work for the fall, it's going to look totally different from the spring. And so we're very proud of the uh, how far we've come. Uh, during the summer, we were able to get everyone who requested a device or a hotspot. And we have a goal uh, to have one-to-one. -one. And so we're very proud of the fact that we've used this disaster for something good to come out of it. So in order to learn at home, <laughs> our students definitely got to have the equipment in order to make that happen. So we're working really hard uh, to manifest that vision of a vice, a hotspot connectivity for all of our 67,000 students, 67, students that we serve. You think you'll make it September 8th? We're going to work hard to make sure that it that we're able to make it. We've already begun the process. Uh, we have, we're beginning 100% remote, as uh, you already know, and we're going to start for three weeks. We have up to eight weeks. But meanwhile, uh, we've already, we already had an order that we were waiting on of 14,000 uh, devices, and we put in another <laughs> substantial order. And if we can get that order in, as Dr. Lathan alluded to, uh, we will have one-to-one. -one. But meanwhile, we have a plan in the case that it, they don't come in when we intend for them to come in. Okay, well, hopefully I, we got the answer to uh, Karina Vallejo's question, who, who asked, will there be laptops and Wi-Fi provided? Hopefully uh, she has the answer yes. there. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. that. Um, okay, well, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, teachers, because there are so many questions folks have about teachers. And um, Mr. Capo, uh, first of all, before I ask a question, I want to ask you, do you have a question of the superintendents? <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> I don't think it's a question at this point, but I was listening to the conversation uh, between the superintendents and the medical professionals there, and, and I see a team of people that are trying to do their very best to meet the needs of kids, make sure everyone is safe, and all I could think through this conversation is how sad it is that for the hard work all of our educators have to do, it takes a pandemic where people are sick and, and, and frankly dying to get to the point where we can actually level the digital divide for our kids who've needed it so much. There's been this struggle going on since the internet was formed, and yet this is what it takes to get us to this point where we can put our kids on level ground, where they could, there can actually be some level of equity. And, and so I just want to applaud them and every single teacher and school employee out there who works hard for, for, for kids that have not had that equity for the last several decades. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure um, everyone is looking at this and going, it should not have taken this, but we'll we'll take the opportunity and seize it and uh, yep. turn it for good. OK, one of the questions I have is uh, from someone named Rebecca, a very big concern she has in regards to teachers who have younger children of their own. If they will not be at school full time, are they required to be on campus full time? Uh, what support will they get? Will they get a free extended day? Will they get a child care stipend? The option to be an online teacher, will that be given to them? Dr. Watson, you're full screen on my screen, so I'm going to start with you. Thank you. So that's a very uh, great question that we've really been working with our school leaders as well as our teachers around. So in Spring ISD, one of the things we just did this past week is we have the opportunity to really collaborate with around 71 different providers within the area. And so what we're really looking at doing for those teachers that have child care issues or, or teachers that have elementary or middle school age children, 
that also need support so they can continue on in their virtual learning. We're looking at ways to bring those child providers in and to provide that as an extra benefit for our teachers. In addition to that, since we are going to be closed for the first four weeks, we have a variety of other positions that rely on students being at school that we have still employed in our district. And we're going to be using a variety of wraparound services to really help meet the needs of our community. One of the things that we've really wanted to stress is the school is only as good as the community, and the community is only as good as the school, and we must work together even more now uh, during a pandemic to really realize the vision that we have set forth here in spring. Very good. Dr. Lathan, same question. And, I, and to that question, I'm going to also add this one. If a teacher or staff catch the virus, is the district paying for their time off in quarantine? So let's start with the question about the child care and then go to the question about uh, if they're going to get paid for time off in quarantine. So we've discussed also with our uh, medical disease um, committee uh, ways to address the issue around teachers or staff members needing child care. As Dr. Watson stated, when we are virtual those first six weeks, we will have other district employees that will be assigned uh, to support teachers, uh, where they'll be actually assigned to that classroom to support students that need additional assistance, where students who need a caring adult to be able to help them. As I stated earlier, we're also partnering with some local churches um, and also some other community providers where we'll have some options for students, places for students to go. Uh, we will be designating some learning centers across our district. We're still working on that. Uh, as I've stated, and, and Mr. Capo will tell you, we've had these conversations during the time. <laughs> we're not mandating. We will take volunteers to support um, not only our teachers, but other administrators who also need to be at work and on campus. We've also discussed uh, those staff members being able to bring their children and, and keep them in their classroom and in that particular area. So we're working through those details. One of the things about having 28,000 employees is you must have everything in writing because you want to be fair to everyone involved. And the other two superintendents will tell you it doesn't really matter the size of your district. If you have one employee you need that, or two, you need to be fair. And so that's what we are actually working on as a district. As it relates to a teacher or any staff member getting COVID, of course, we have a process through our Human Resources Department that we will follow as it relates to whether we send that staff member home and let's say we're reassigning them to home, that's what we call it in HISD for whatever reason, then there's a way the district handles that. If employees utilize their sick bank for decisions that they make, they will have that opportunity. We also have our extended sick bank that staff members can tap into if they're members of. So it just depends on the individual situation for that employee. What I will tell you, and I know my other colleagues have said the same thing, we are going to be understanding and empathetic to our employees and their situations because all of this is new for us. We know, like I said, we know how to educate children and we do a great job of educating children. We don't know how to operate in a pandemic. And I love to say we do have doctor titles, but we are not medical doctors. <laughs> and, uh, but sometimes I, I, these last couple of months, I feel like I have been a medical doctor. <laughs> I've had to make no offense, Dr. Shaw, no offense, but, <laughs> um, but no, we they will be you as part of the club. <laughs> <laughs> working with our employees because all of us have experienced having to close our facilities or employees needing to be at home. You know, um, Gene, if I could just, oh, yes, if I could just jump in really quickly, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Aniega and I uh, talked about this earlier as well, and I think it's important to just put out there, the Kaiser Family Foundation, which, as you know, is a very respected uh, organization that really uh, provides a lot of information on a variety of health issues. Um, they found that uh, they did an analysis in July, and they found that you uh, about a quarter of uh, U.S. teachers across the country are at risk of severe illness from COVID-19. That's either because they're over the age of 65 or because they have chronic health conditions, for example, underlying lung disease, uh, or because of um, body mass index uh, above uh, some number. So when you put those kinds of um, uh, elements together, it's not just about having kids in school, but it's also we've got a quarter of those teachers that we also have to protect and be mindful of as well. And so we're trying to balance both of those. And so uh, Dr. Latham and Dr. Watson are both correct in, in what they said, that we have to make sure our teachers are protected as well while they're trying to educate everyone's children at the same time. 
And Dr. Shaw was going to come to you next because I have this question, and I'm going to get to you, Dr. Goffney, in a second about the teachers. But if a school has a breakout, if they believe they have several co uh, cases of COVID on their campus, is the county going to be able to provide testing that's easy and accessible to maybe dozens, maybe hundreds of people? Because right now, it's very difficult to do that. Is there any conversation about being able to, to go to a campus and administer tests there? Well, that's actually what we've been uh, working in our plans. What does that look like? Again, a lot of moving pieces of how the state and, and the local dynamics have been working. Uh, there, there are obviously the concerns about what happens as if it's a if it's a small um, a number of students that are in a contained classroom where there's no interaction with the rest of the school versus kids that are moving between obviously different classrooms or you know obviously the concern around uh, cafeteria and how kids may be in gym or in other parts of common areas. So that's a real uh, it's a great question, but it's a real concern because it's not just about what do we do? So we say, okay, everybody go back to school in person, but what do you do if you do have a cluster or an outbreak? What are those steps? And those are the discussions and the plans that we've already been working on, but that's exactly what some of the moving pieces has been because when you have numbers so high, look, when we're saying that, look, one in four, uh, maybe it's dropped from 24.5%, which was like, Thursday, Friday of last week to 22 or 23%, but it might fluctuate back up. Let's say it's one in five or one in four tests that are coming back positive. Even if you say it's it's less than that, you say, okay, I don't believe it's one in five, one in four, one in five, maybe it's one in six, whatever it is for the kids, you still have a significant number of kids that are in that classroom. So you have 30 children in the classroom. Now, if you say, do the math, one in five, one in six, that's a lot of kids in that classroom that might actually be positive. That opens up a whole set of case investigation for the individual and contact tracing for the other students, teachers, faculty, parents, et cetera. So that is an additional piece that is really very concerning and that's why we have to get our rates and our numbers down. Gina, I think the key message here is look, all of us want our kids to be back in school in person, but we are also adults. It is up to us how we model those behaviors for our children, how we do the things that we can do to, to get our kids back in school safer and as early as possible, because that's up to us. We drive these numbers down. We drive these rates down. We drive these hospitalizations down. Guess what you get? You get a safer environment and kids can actually get back in school, but that means it's going to take all of us. When my children see me and they don't see me wear my mask, they're going to say, hey, what's going on? They're going to model those unhealthy behaviors. And so our administrators and our teachers are going to be blue in their face trying to tell and get kids to wear masks and do all the social distance. But if they're not even seeing it at home, then they're going to come to school and they're going to potentially make that um, a situation where it's going to be worse for not just themselves, but other kids that are in that classroom. Those are some significant concerns, and that's why we've got to drive these rates down. Does anyone on the panel have the question, or rather have the answer to the question right now? What do you do if you have an outbreak on your campus and people need to be tested? Does anyone have a simple answer for how dozens of people get tested easily when we, school resumes? Um, in HSD, as it relates to our employees, we have some partnerships with uh, various providers where we're standing up those partnerships where we'll be able uh, to send our employees to get tested. Not only our own district or district-wide uh, clinics, but we have some other partners that we're working with where our employees can get tested. The issue that we're experiencing it will be around getting our students tested, but we do have a plan to be able to get our employees tested. And what is your thought right now on how to handle students being tested? Are they right well, now at the mercy of going to a public place where there's a long line and a multi-day wait? Unfortunately, we're at that. We're, that's where we are. And, and here's, the, here's the reality, though. For most of the children we serve in HISD, that's their reality, even when there's not a pandemic. All the time. Because they are yeah. always waiting somewhere for some type mm -hmm. of public assistance. So that's already an issue for the children that we serve. Uh, and so that's one of the major concerns. And that's another factor when, you know, decisions to remain closed is you have to take that all into consideration. But what I'd also like to just share is not only for my two colleagues, and they'll tell you 
but every superintendent, not only the superintendents in Region 4, but every superintendent across the state made a decision based on the community that they serve, based on the data that they received from their community. And so from place to place, you might see someone, uh, some districts reopening face-to-face, uh, -face, others going virtual, but we all use that data that we received from our community. For me, because we are the largest employer and perhaps the largest number of teachers in Harris County and in the city of Houston, we did use that data from the county health department. But I just wanna make sure that parents and community members understand that it is an individual district decision, but it doesn't mean anyone doesn't care about the people that they serve. Dr. Lathan, you said a mouthful when you reminded us all that that's a regular way of life for those young people <laughs> to have to uh, deal with deal with uh, grave inconveniences just to get uh, uh, health care. Uh, Dr. Goffney, I didn't give you a chance to talk about uh, what you have in, in store, what you have planned in case you have uh, an outbreak of COVID among your staff or, or on your campus with your students. Um, same as my colleagues, we're blessed with some great partnerships right now that have worked. Uh, this summer, we partnered with Texas Children's Hospital, um, and they have provided testing for some of our students, and it's been very well received by our community. Uh, also, we have a local health clinic at one of our campuses, and uh, so we know we'll be able to utilize them. In addition, I have to say, our local officials, um, our local elected officials have been very responsive. When we were having an, an outbreak with um, in our operations department, whether it was with um, warehouse or custodians and so on and so forth. We reached out to one of the uh, local commissioners or uh, and also uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and they uh, stood up sites in our district so that our, um, our not only our, our staff, but even our families would have access. So that's been real positive. And we're going to be real intentional as we as we move forward on how we can be uh, more responsive. I can tell you, uh, as my colleagues have already alluded to, um, it's going to take all of us working together. I think Dr. Sean said it best. It's going to take the community working with the schools because although you alluded that we were mid-sized, we have 67,000 students and we have nearly 9,000 employees. And so even when we reached out, uh, the number of tests at each site, uh, one was 500. And so when we are trying to uh, test a whole campus, one of our campuses has nearly 3,000 kids. Uh, they could be very uh cumbersome and a, and a challenge. But what I'm pleased about is our plan for how we're going to move forward. We're going to be based on the conditions that exist right now as it relates to Aldine. You talk about the 23% positivity rate. When you look at the zip codes in Aldine uh, with the mm -hmm. highest mortality mm -hmm. rate, <laughs> the highest mortality rate for uh, Harris County is in Aldine. It's 77338. I mean, that is alarming. And so based on the conditions that exist right now, we had no other choice but to go remote, to start remote. And so even uh, we know that we have a choice based on school board uh, approval and uh, PEA support and even the recommendation of our local county judge uh, to extend that. And we uh, certainly are going to be looking at what's happening. But even when we open up, remember, I know you asked about Springs numbers and uh, Dr. Lathan's numbers, but in mm -hmm. Aldine, uh, think about this. When we ask our parents to commit, 70% of our families said that they are going to continue with learning at home. 70%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 28 to 30% said that they would send their children to school. So that's going to allow us to automatically be able to social distance a little bit more. But still, there's a, a, a transition period. So we would never allow just every kid to report day one. We're going to go through a teaching phase on our three um, non-negotiables as far as face-to-face -face instruction, and that's going to be, as Dr. Uh, Shaw already alluded to, we have to be uncompromising when it comes to universal masking. Uh, we've got to continue to teach uh, um, uh, hand hygiene, which we started doing that in February. We thought that was going to keep it from coming. And then, of course, uh, practice the physical and social distancing. And so um, that's the plan we have in place. And again, I think Dr. Lathan said it best. We're not medical doctors, but we do know how to educate. And we know how to follow a plan when we when we have a plan. When we have good information, we can make good decisions. And everyone's making the very best decisions they can for the communities that they serve. Dr. Goffney, I have a question that was specifically sent in to us for you. It's okay. from Alika. <laughs> and Alika <laughs> says, um, and she moves us into our next area of conversation, are there any provisions being made for virtual teaching where teachers can teach the students through Zoom? And so I want to add on to that. 
this concept, Dr. Latham made it clear, grades will count. So mm -hmm. this concept of teaching virtually in its next iteration now in the fall, um, is it going to be Zoom type classes or will it be kind of like my kids experienced last year where it was just click on some YouTube videos? <laughs> Uh, Gina, that's a really good question, and I'm so thankful uh, for my parent or community member who asked. Cause so, so like you, I have a 16-year-old, and God knows homeschooling was, was was difficult for my husband and me, and we're both educators, but I'm telling you, it was hard. And one of the things was I was able to see firsthand what the spring looked like. And what I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, the fall is going to look much more different from the spring. And let me tell you why. While I'm definitely uh, making every decision as far as safety and keeping our staff safe, keeping our teachers safe, because we know that the teacher in a classroom is the great equalizer. We recognize that. And being a child of poverty, you know, I couldn't imagine going through this and being at home and not having anyone to support or to help or, or to move forward. And so having a grandmother who worked all the time and a grandfather who did lawns and worked and then not having the capacity to help. So our teachers, mm -hmm. I mean, literally, what they do is going to matter even more than in the spring. Because, again, in the spring, we were, we were reacting on proud of the work. But think about it. 70% of our students who are going to be working from home, I, we, need the, we need our teachers bringing their best every day as we meet the needs. Because our, te our students reading, math, science, social studies, all of those things are still important. And so not only we are going with an asynchronous model because we wanted flexibility. We recognize that some of our parents, kind of the asynchronous model, meaning they will be able to access their daily work every single day at any okay. time. However, <laughs> there will be a synchronous component because we're going to expect small group instruction. And so through that small group instruction, whether they do it through Zoom, Blue Jeans, whatever they do it through, it, there's going to be an expectation. In addition, <laughs> For those that have connectivity issues or device issues, and we realized this through Aldine Cares um, this spring semester, we're going to pick up the phone and we're going to call. Hi, Gina, how are you? Um, are you having any trouble on that assignment? Let's go over it real quick, okay? And we're going to have a conversation, but our, we're going to have a touch point every day. So, so the Aldine, teachers are going to have to do this as well as teach the class? Well, that's, the, that's a tall load. So, think is if they were teaching, the teachers who teach face to face um, may not be the teachers who are teaching virtually. Keep in mind, so we're starting 100% remote, so everybody will be remote the first three weeks at least. However, once we transition to the 70% and 30 for elementary and for high school, um, yes, ma'am, the part that's online is in Schoology or through whatever platform that you use, and our, our students will have access to it. The teachers are going to be expected to provide daily feedback and daily interaction with with our with our students, especially those in K five, pre K five. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, let, let me ask uh, you these other school district superintendents, Dr. Watson. Let me ask you about what your virtual learning looks like. Will it be interactive, i.e., something like a Zoom, where there's mm -hmm. accountability and you're? I know you guys want to take take attendance because you got to get that money. I mean, no, that, no offense, but, you know, district students are willing to run and pay salaries. Um, so how will you make the students accountable, and how will they have some actual interaction with their teacher, Dr. Watson? Absolutely. I think the, the most important thing was really um, listening to our parents and hearing from them about what their individual experience was in the spring and then showing them that we've listened to their feedback and how we're pivoting uh, for the instruction uh, for the fall. And so much like Dr. Goffney indicated, we will be using the guidance and implementing both synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So I think it's important for our families to really understand the difference between the two. When we talk about asynchronous instruction, it is really that students are engaged in learning materials on their own time, interacting intermittently with the teacher via the computer. And that mimicked a little bit of more about what we were able to offer in the spring. But when we think about the synchronous instruction, this is um, really two-way, real-time live instruction between teachers and students uh, through the use of the computer. And so as we implement that synchronous instruction, it's important that for in Spring ISD, for both in-person and remote learning environments, students will 
Um, all the lessons will be learning centered and teacher directed, and they'll be using the subject specific instruction driven by school schedules. And so earlier I talked a little bit about the schedules that I will be providing. Um, in the spring semester, we provided a lot of assignments for kids to do and teachers checked in with kids, asked questions. But one of the things that was paramount from our community and for our, our teacher and administrator and central office groups as they were developing the plan was the notion of specific minutes. Um, as it relates to students receiving um, subject-specific instruction in those areas. So, for example, at the elementary level, our students will have 90 minutes of direct subject-specific instruction uh, that's facilitated by the teacher in the remote and in the in-person environment. Um, then they're going to have about 45 minutes of small group instruction or tutorials that's assigned by the teacher, then followed by another 30 minutes of either a lunch or a brain break, and then they'll go right back into 90 minutes of direct teacher subject specific instruction followed by another 45 minutes of small group instruction. Now we have various schedules for various uh, levels versus elementary through high school. But I think it's important to understand at the very end of the day, our teachers at the elementary, middle, and high school level, we will be able to provide our families that 40 minutes of office hours. And this is where when parents have questions or concerns or they need a, a little extra support in terms of um, how they're helping to meet the needs of their children at home, that we have those office hours to be able to have that reciprocal two-way conversation um, between the parent and the teacher. And so we're really trying to uh, remain nimble in terms of um, how we're able to provide that support for our families. But it is important for families to know that we have some very, we have very structured days that we're planning for in-person and for remote learning and that it will look different. And in Spring ISD, much like all the other districts here, it's all hands on deck. And so when we're talking about communicating with parents, we want our teachers to be able to focus on the most important thing, which is providing the education for the students um, in person or remotely. And so that may mean that some of us that don't um, that are not teaching in classrooms, that we may have to come alongside and support by calling families and using other people to let parents know that we all are working together to meet the needs of their child. But in general, you will either be a teacher assigned to virtual learning or be assigned to on-campus learning rather than back and forth. Is that correct? I think that's really going to depend on the number of students. So right now we have about 35% of our families that are opting for in-person and about 65% of our families right now that are opting for a remote. And so based upon the needs of the kids, as, as I'm sure you understand, we can have more teachers that want remote than we have teachers in school to be able to teach the kids who are coming back when it's safe. And so we're going to be looking... And how does the breakup go with what teachers want? So that's the information that we're looking at now in terms of those teachers that are going through the HR process that are indicating based upon their individual need that they want to be remote teachers. And so we're using the process to go through, um, teachers are identifying their specific needs that they have. They're going through HR, filling out the necessary forms based upon their own individual request. And based upon that request and the process that we go through, we'll be able to help meet those teachers' needs and plug them into the environment that best suits the outcome of that need. Mr. Kappel, what is the biggest concern you're hearing from teachers? Because I certainly, in, in the discussion with uh, Dr. Dr. Watson, see one of the challenges, and that is if there's a mismatch in what the student uh, and family population wants and what uh, the population of teachers on that campus want to offer in terms of the form of their service. So, but what are you hearing is the big issue? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, you actually had two very separate and, and uh, intertwined issues going on right there. There's the matching of those teachers that are willing and able to do in-person learning uh, with the kids that want it and, and, and those teachers that simply can't. Just as Dr. Shaw was saying, and Dr. Shaw, Dr. Onyeda, I thank you very much for all the information that you are putting out. Frankly, our educators are questioning what medical advice to be able to actually watch anymore, and, and you all are an important voice. Um, so that, that point that was made by Dr. Shaw, those 25% that are in that higher risk categories, we really should be working systemically to make sure that those are the individuals that are, are given some level of priority for those virtual uh, classes, to teach those virtual classes as they need because they are at the highest risk. And that may necessarily mean, as we talked about last time, partnering them with somebody who is really adept at online learning so that they're walking through this process together. The second thing, you know, I, I think the health concerns first and foremost, the safety and what would happen uh, if they were to become 
COVID positive is by far the thing on their mind. But when we start talking about the practice, one of the things that you are all talking about as well, too, is the concern about having to do both in-person learning and online learning at one time. I think that that's a real concern that they would feel like they're put in a place to not be successful at all. So I'm really glad to hear the school leaders talking about making sure that we're getting them into one place or the other. They will either be doing virtual learning with those students that need it because it takes a, a whole lot of different um, a different skills and, and it completely turns your classroom management skills around in a different direction than what they're used to as an in-person as well. So having that opportunity to be able to focus and work on developing the engagement that's necessary through an online form without having to also do the traditional classroom management is probably going to relieve many of them to hear that. Dr. Lathan, is that kind of what you are uh, going for at HISD, that you're either an on-campus teacher or a virtual teacher? That's our plan. Like I said, we might have just a few outliers. It depends on the particular specific content area. And I guess I'm thinking more of a, at high school versus, you know, our elementary or middle school campuses. Uh, and so that's what we're thinking. I do want to put a plug in for two things because I see our time is running short. Number uh -huh. one, HID uh, Sparks Learning, that will be our enrichment camp that we'll offer from August the 24th through September 3rd for all K-12 students. So they'll actually have an opportunity to start and getting engaged with academic learning prior to September 8th. And then also we are launching a virtual parent course, a parent education course, so parents understand and know how to access our platforms, the questions that they should be asking their students, how to go back and retrieve videos that are recorded during the uh, lessons throughout the school day. That launch is actually on Monday, August the 3rd. Very good. I wish I wish really all school districts gave, gave us a week online first just to get everybody transitory time to make sure everybody knows how to do all the logistics online and like you said, the parent university and, and all of that. But anyway, uh, that's just Gina Gaston Ellie's little two cents. Uh, uh, Liz Fernandez wrote in, and I want to ask you this, Dr. Lathan. She says, when will parents know how the virtual learning day will look? As a household with two working parents, we support the virtual opening, but need time to plan around our work schedule, realizing that our kinder students work best during the day, afternoon evening school is not an option for us. You have so many parents in this situation uh, where they work, and you know they, they do feel... Uh, reticent to send their kid back to the classroom, but logistically speaking, uh, they are not at home during the day, and which quite frankly is why I'm a little surprised the numbers were so overwhelming on these school districts to keep your kid at home when I know so fa many families work. But Dr. Lathan, what are your thoughts about how the district kind of helps these uh, working families or single parent homes where the parent obviously has to work? So number one, going back to that parent orientation course, uh, that information mm -hmm. will be shared there. All of our schools will be hosting their normal virtual open houses, meet the teacher night, where the schedules will be shared with their with parents so they'll know what that school day looks like. Um, and so that information will be shared out. Also, we have an instructional continuity plan that right now that we're going through making sure that our principals and our teachers understand what the expectations are district wide. It will be a little bit different than when we are normally face to face because our schools do have more flexibility. I will tell you it's, it's going to be much tighter than in the spring as it relates to our instructional continuity plan. But once again, that information will be shared through our parent orientation and courses, and every school will be sharing uh, with their child, uh, with their students, um, their schedule. Okay, and I want to get to each of you on this one. Dr. Lathan, I'm going to start with you because I know you, you were a, a high school athlete yourself. Uh, the question over UIL. Um, I have I have three varsity athletes in my house who work really hard to get where they are. Uh, first of all, if you are able to do sports uh, once classes resume on campus, because I know I know all the school districts are not doing sports or extracurriculars while they're you're not on campus. So so that's agreed across the board. Once you have the option to be on campus or or virtual learning, if you're an athlete. Do you have to be enrolled in on-campus learning to participate in the school period of extracurriculars? 
if they are enrolled, whether it's face-to-face -face or the parent selects virtual, we will still be uh, offering our students uh, athletics. They'll have the opportunity to participate when we are back truly face-to-face. -face. But will they be able to participate only after school? Or like my daughter, for example, has volleyball fifth period. Can she be off campus but just come in for fifth period to do volleyball and then go back home? So that's a little bit different. I know what you're saying because uh, having a former uh, athlete, uh, we didn't. When I was a track star and shot and shot put and discus, let me just say that for everyone. Right. Tommy Rodney, uh, <laughs> we didn't have those athletic periods. But for the school day, no, they will be coming in for practice after school. They would not just come in for that athletic period. Uh, only because, once again, everything is about scheduling. Everything is about the number of teachers we need face-to-face -face and the number of teachers that we need virtually. So they would follow their traditional either early in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, if you have that swim class, or, or practice, or after school. Okay. Dr. Watson, let me ask you the same Yes. Can I yes. Can just say one thing? Um, just really quickly, um, this is so great to hear our school districts and all of their plans because this is exactly very similar to the healthcare system. When, when we were having these, these real concerns early on in March and in and, and April, and as you know, all the, all the numbers that were at that time, we were thinking very scary, but obviously it was nothing like what it, what it was mar markedly later. Um, we were trying to flatten that curve because we were trying to give our healthcare system time to plan. Time to be able to do things, right? And so our healthcare system now, if we were in the same situation it was months ago, they would not be able to handle the the patients because of not having all those, you know, they were putting people on a ventilator immediately versus now thinking about maybe that's a last resort, you know, putting a patient on their on their stomach rather than their back. These kinds of things that they learned, and this is what I applaud our schools with, and our school districts that we've talked about that they've had time now to really plan through some of this. And that's so amazing to me. It's so heartening, despite I, I was a football player, but not a star. I just kind of put it out there. Um, but I, it is heartening to hear all these because this is exactly what's been fantastic about is is to see our, our school districts doing what they need to be doing to protect their kids, but also their, their, their students, their parents, and all of the plans that they've put in place because it really is about how do you give time for systems to be sure that they're ready when it's time to be able to go into in-person uh, or, in this case, online learning? So I just wanted to make that quick comment as well. Appreciate that. Dr. Watson, I'm going to ask you about the extracurriculars. What will be your policy? If you are uh, choosing uh, distance learning, will you be able to, to do sports and will you be able to come on campus if you have a, a period of athletics during the school day? So we're committed to ensuring that all of our students, regardless of the environment that you choose in person or remote, have access to all extracurricular activities, whether that be UIL or non-UIL activities. However, for students who are on campus participating in our Safety First in-person model, they will have opportunity to participate in in-person during the day. So if they have an athletic period, they will have that. If you choose the Empowered Learning at Home remote option, you will not have the option to come in during the day. However, we are committed to transportation for students before school and after school to ensure they can participate. Let's talk about transportation, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to you in just a moment about the uh, athletics, Dr. Goffney. Dana, you, you you know, you know what? what you. I, I, I'm, in, I'm itching to get in because we got to let the nose no competitive. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you go ahead and get back to Dr. Watson. Go ahead. I'm going to let you take the mic. I'm just letting the record reflect that I was a star athlete, too. I was a star athlete. You are such a good role panel. But it was as well. And I thought the question was going to come to me because right before I logged on, my daughter, who's competing for varsity in, uh, at Nimitz High School, one of our high schools, She's like, Mama, why can't we practice? Why can't we practice? And, and, and so this, this question is very timely. I just wanted the record to reflect that, yes, I was an athlete, and yes, I love. I, I actually met this week with my um, athletic director, executive director of athletics, and also a fine arts, and we were talking about this very uh, timely topic. Uh, and just like my colleagues, I don't have anything to add, but other than to say to Aldine uh, that if you choose learning at home, uh, you will have access to athletic or band uh, before or after school. And if you choose learning at school, of course, you would have your, your, your normal schedule. 
And so <laughs> I just had to put that in there. You know, I want I want to be known for my athletic ability as well. Well, and you know, I asked that question because because truthfully, when you're a, a, a competitive person, and all of y'all know about that, apparently, <laughs> you know, you, you're going to lose some footing when you're not there on campus to take right. the uh, instruction during the day as well, whether that's band or sports or whatever. So I just wanted the to be challenge clear. is because of safety and because of the numbers and just trying to control it, and and I was fighting yeah. to figure out how we could do it during the day and provide uh, transportation and to do everything that we could, but thinking about uh, our protocols. And as Dr. Shaw just alluded to, one of the things that we're proud of, the fact that we're starting remote and then going to phase in is so we can get our protocols in place and get really yeah. good at keeping our teachers safe and our students safe. And so if we have a lot of coming in and out, that's, that's harder to control. And so, uh, but we are excited about the fact that before and after school, um, our athletes, our band, any extracurricular, they'll have access. Makes sense. Okay. Let me go back to you, Dr. Watson, and talk about a follow-up on the transportation issue. Um, a lot of people have written us with questions about transportation. How do you facilitate uh, bus service for kids and social distancing, and how do you decide when to phase back more widespread uh, bus transportation services? Thank you for the question. So I think that's really going to rely on the data, the data that we rely on from the um, Harris County um, Health Department to really help us as it relates to the statistics necessary to make those decisions. Now, within our model, I shared, shared earlier that when we are in, when we're able to come back, um, we do have what we call an operational decision meter that really helps us determine um, how we're going to um, offer in-person instruction for students. And so, for example, we're currently in the red, which means that the majority of students would participate in remote learning. Uh, when we transition to the orange, we will go to a hybrid model, and that would mean that we would split students up by the last name. So on an A day, students with the um, last name starting with A through K um, would come in and participate on the A day, and the other half of the students on the B day, once again with that Wednesday, um, for deep cleaning. And so within that, we are thereby decreasing the number of students that would be on the bus at one time. Um, we do have a variety of protocols, much like all the other districts that are um, on the uh, online with us today. Um, there's several protocols that we have in place to social distance uh, kids on the bus, as well as we are um, providing masks. So if a parent um, has children that will be riding the bus and they don't have masks, we're going to provide that for them. Um, we did change our, our schedules for the start of school for the elementary, middle, and high school levels. And we did that for two reasons. We did that to ensure we could have staggering pickups to allow time for us to deep clean the buses between the routes, as well as opportunities for us to use our electrostatic uh, guns, um, should we say, to really be able to go through and sanitize. So I think that's important that, that sanitation is happening in between those routes. And so it did pose a change in our starting and ending times, but we did so to ensure the safety of transporting students to and from school. Very good. Uh, Dr. Lathan, uh, hey, same question. Hey, yes, hey, please. Hey, uh -huh. hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. No. But I just wanted to just make mention of, I, I really am thankful for the conversation and hearing um, a lot of what the plans are with, that the districts are implementing. And, and certainly these are issues that are very high on the minds of so many of us, um, transportation, the digital uh, sort of model that's happening, also the digital divide that exists. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the, um, not only the physical um, aspects of the health is considered of, of, of children, but also that social and emotional um, mm -hmm. aspect is also considered as we are also moving forward with our plans as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we also brought that up. We know that there are a number of um, issues that may be happening and we want to make sure that those issues are also addressed as well. I'm, I'm glad that you did bring, yeah, I'm glad that you did bring that up because just as some people say, you know, I don't want my kid exposed to COVID. There are a whole lot of people who say that the risk, especially to elementary age kids pre-puberty uh, to COVID is not as great, but they're concerned about the development of their child socially and also the mental well-being of their child or the household, because um, it's stressful for a parent to have to teach multiple kids. Um, I know. <laughs> I know it's very difficult. So yeah, that's a very valid point, and I'm glad that you I'm glad that you brought it up. And, and sometimes people criticize us as journalists for acting as though the only risk is COVID, and there are multiple risks. Uh, because of this pandemic, and one is your mental and social well-being. So I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Latham. We are getting 
our, our hour has passed, but as I said, we're on elastic time. So I do want to give you a chance, Dr. Lathan, to, to just kind of uh, wrap us up with your, your um, plan in regards to transportation and uh, what, what the plan is that you're going to start out with and then uh, how you in, and tend to evolve that plan. So similar to actually to Dr. Watson, uh, one of the, another difference for us, and it would probably be the same for my other colleagues, is we will have some schools uh, we've talked about A day, B day, operating on the A day, B day, or hybrid model for our high school students. But some of our campuses actually will be able to bring all of their students back five days a week because of the fact that that particular building is under enroll, they have under enrollment, a lower enrollment. And so it will vary similar to what we did during Harvey, where we had a rolling start and we had those schools and categories. That's the same thing we're planning for our HISD schools. I also want to address mental, mental health. We have a mental health hotline that operates actually 24 hours a day. The number is 713-556-1340. Parents and students can call that hotline. We also, when we are in virtual and also back face-to-face, -face, we'll be continuing to provide webinars in English and Spanish uh, around social emotional support. And so those videos will be available. They're live, but they also can be retrieved later. And then our hotline is 713 713- Five five six four six three six. Parents can call and receive uh, information and assistance. All right. Well, I want to again thank all of you for uh, being part of this panel today. I, I hope that uh, we were able to answer a lot of questions that so many families have on their minds about health, about uh, the challenges our teachers that our teachers are facing, and and that those challenges are met by the school districts and also that you're doing what you always do, which is to try to meet the needs of families and children. So we continue to wish you the best <laughs> as you navigate this uh, unchartered area uh, facing this pandemic, COVID-19 and our schools. Again, we appreciate you and we hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. Thank you.